Welcome to My Mind's Eye, where we talk about mind and brain and listen to music about those topics. Today we're going to be talking with Liz Phelps, a professor of psychology and neuroscience at NYU, about memory and forgetting. I remember everything, everything about you, the way you'd walk and talk and all the things you do. Sweet things that you used to say They're like a broken record in my head all day Now there's nothing else to talk about Nothing else to do you, Joe, what were you doing 9-11? You'd have a story, I'm sure, that would give me all the details of how you first heard about it, where you were, where you went next, who you talked to, what you saw. I mean, I have that exact same experience. I know every little detail of that, you know, whole day up until about noon, I could tell you in, you know, minute seconds, right? The, um, the problem is, uh, that's about 50% right. Your memory for 9-11 is about 50% right. My memory is about 50% right. Now, I am sure my memory is right, right? But the data suggests I'm wrong about that. And then you have to ask the question, why, why does our confidence for highly emotional events exceed our accuracy? And exactly how does emotion change your memory? Sweet things that you used to say, like a broken record in my head all day. Liz, you've been working on ways to alter memory, especially in an effort to help people control unwanted feelings of fear and anxiety. Give us a little background on this and tell us what you've been up to. So we've known for a long time that every time you store a memory, there's a period of time where the synaptic changes that become the memory in your brain occur. And that period is called consolidation. And it takes a, it takes a, a decent amount of time for that to happen. If we were to do something before you fully stored the memory, the best example of this is if you get a concussion. Um, if you get a concussion, often people don't remember what happened right beforehand, and it's thought to be because the concussion has sort of disrupted that storage process. And we call that process consolidation. And um, there was this renewed interest in this other idea that basically now every time you retrieve a memory, it once again has to go through a storage process this sort of reconsolidation window. This was sort of reinvigorated by a study by Kareem Nader in your lab, um, where he was able to show, take a simple, uh, a simple threat memory, uh, pair a shock with a sound, and, um, and later on, after that memory was stored or consolidated, just play the sound, inject into the lateral amygdala, where we know these sort of synaptic connections occur, a drug that blocks that storage process. And when, when Kareem did this, uh, it looked like the memory was gone. The rat no longer um, showed any type of fear response or threat response to the tone itself. Um, so this was really exciting, super exciting work. Uh, we wanted to do it in humans. Um, but we can't. We can't inject these drugs into the amygdala in humans. But this, this type of work suggested to us that memories are vulnerable even long after they're stored. Um, and you can make them vulnerable again by retrieving them. And so two students, Marie Monfils working with you, studying rodents, and Daniela Schiller working with me, studying humans, got together and um, started to think about different ways to do this. Um, and one of the things that they came up with was maybe, you know, memories are vulnerable uh, in different ways. So you don't have to target it with a drug, but when it's vulnerable, if you introduce new information during that time window, this sort of reconsolidation window, you might be able to permanently alter the memory. And that's what the data suggested. When we were running blind and tearing free. 
So let's talk about the broader implications of this work. How does it fit into the context of our general understanding of memory, and can it possibly be used therapeutically? We kind of think of memories, I think the lay person thinks of memories like a tape recorder. I mean, psychologists have known this is not true. Um, you know, some of the earliest, you know, work in memory suggested that memories reconstructed, you know, that you sort of bring in new information with old information, uh, and really it's like a, a retelling of a story. Someone once gave me the analogy of the game of telephone, right? So, you know, you tell something to somebody else, you tell something to somebody else, and next thing you know, it's like a whole different thing at the end. This is a process, a natural process that occurs, and it occurs whether we understand it or not, right? And so, um, the fact that we can understand it, however, and now start to target it specifically, suggests you know, we can think about using this in therapy. One of the ways this might work is to think about these time windows when memories might be most valuable and then do your intervention. So I think one of the best examples is actually a study that took advantage of this vulnerable period. They, they essentially replicated what we did um, and they used our exact parameters and did it with addicts and showed some success. And I think that's probably the best example of translating this basic work that you and I developed um, to a clinical domain. Well, I just want to forget how to remember you. Any advice on how to improve memory? Hello, Lima, Mike. November, Romeo. These people that join these memory competitions, they're really fascinating, but they're just using the tricks you already know, right? You know, and these are mnemonics, right? How to like organize the things you think about, how to make them salient or important. Tango, uniform. But certainly our memory is malleable in the fact that, you know, the way we try to remember things, the strategies we use, can help us remember things better. You know, and this is true if you're in the early stages of, you know, mild cognitive impairment or young, you know, we can do things to improve our memory. We just have to want to, we have to work at it. It's possible. What about how to forget? That's harder. How do we forget is harder for sure. Um, yeah. Do you have any good advice, Jeff? I don't know. <laughs> Oh, I just want to forget I remember